I had inspirations to be a machine gunner, <laughs> you know, a gung ho kid and, 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 uh, but when the MOSs came out, I got 0341 for mortars and I was kind of disappointed and really heartbroken, but, mm. uh, got to the school and, you know, went through the process of learning about mortars and stuff. And, uh, when I got to the company or actually when I got to the battalion, uh, and sent to, uh, the section that was out on Hill 22 where Charlie company was, uh, and, and kind of got my, you know, feet grounded and met all the guys and kind of started interacting and becoming one of them finally. And, um, uh, it was always talked about that Charlie hadn't had a, uh, an FO for quite a while. He had been killed on an operation, uh, Mameluke thrust. And, um, uh, so I, I don't know if the guys were kind of searching around. There was about three of us, I think that went to uh, Charlie company who had been through uh, most of our earlier training together. And, um, so I saw the opportunity to become a grunt and I took it. Uh, we had a already, scout observer there which is an enlisted person in lieu of an, an officer uh, uh Dwayne Van Fleet he taught me everything that I needed to know and, and more and it was uh very thorough he was uh a real professional as a sergeant uh, and I'm sure through his whole career he excelled uh Wait. and he he really uh, schooled me very well, including uh, uh, naval gunfire, fixed wing um, artillery, and and uh, beyond the usual schooling that a mortar FO would would get. When you're on the C-130 on your way from Okinawa to Da Nang, you don't know at that time that you're going to be an FO, but you, I'm sure you do know you're going to be in combat situations given, you know, your, your training with mortars. As you, you know, in your mind's eye, place yourself on that plane and you're, and you can see the other Marines, you know, lined up on, or you're sitting on both sides, I'm guessing, right? You can look across and see one another. Um, How would you describe, you know, so far as you can recall it, your own thinking? Were you thinking... Uh, this is an adventure. Were you thinking, what the heck have I got myself into? Um, <laughs> you know, kind of what, you know, as you look back, what, what do you suppose was going through your mind? Um, I knew what I was in for, you know, uh, this is 68 and, and uh, I had friends who had already come home from Vietnam who were Marines or army and, uh, some air force and and uh, so i had a pretty good notion of what to expect but uh you said uh, oh my god what do i get myself into that's about a week or two after boot camp you know and then pretty soon you start realizing hey it, i'm in this thing you better get going and uh and then that kind of fades away and you do everything you can to learn everything you can to survive because you know where you're going mm. um the only question i had at the time is where and with what unit i was going to be assigned to you know and how that process was going to be and uh those were all just blank pages to all of us basically and we had quite a few guys who were going over for their second tour and uh, one or two for even their third tour and uh uh you know, so there was a little leadership there on, on what to expect. And we landed, uh, I was on the first plane and it, and we landed, uh, and we got out of the plane and of course you're going to form up and you've got some people there to meet us and, uh, drove a Jeep out and these guys get out and, and kind of tell us what's going on. Uh, and uh, then behind those guys was a was a formation of guys in, uh, in utilities, you know, uh, jungles that the jungles are rotting off them. They're red from all the, you know, the dirt over there is really red. Some of these guys had come down from Kantian and and uh, 
all those ugly places up in Northern i and, and including even Ann Waugh was, was really bad, the 5th Marine uh, area, tactical area. And, and, uh, and so these guys were pretty, uh, they'd been through the ringer. You could tell on their faces, you could tell by their demeanor, their slackness, basically, you know, here we are spitting shine and, just out of a real regimented uh, mindset from training and being a new boot, basically, and seeing these guys with, uh, you know, mustaches, longer hair, uh, real tanned. And these are the guys who are going home? These guys going home. And so <laughs> the second plane's coming in behind us, and uh, <laughs> and uh, he just about ready to touch down, and we get mortared. And uh, and rocketed, oh, and uh, and just. But you're on the ground for. Well, I'm on the ground in formation minutes. with everybody. You know the people, yeah. the Marines that were on that plane, and and I think all of us were Marines. Um, from that uh, staging uh, unit in back in the states, and uh, or maybe picked some other people up in Okinawa. I couldn't tell you for sure, but. So immediately being and knowing I'm ignorant and stupid and, and I key on the guys who are, who are, had been there for 13 months or whatever. And um, uh, I saw one guy take off like he'd been probably 26 Marines or something at case on him. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going with that guy. And I broke formation and took off. He could, he was about 50 meters uh, in front of me running towards where I don't know where, but uh, I passed him. Mm. And uh, yeah. he said, go where that 55-gallon drum is. There's a, there's a trench there. Dive into it. <laughs> So I did, I dove into it. It was deep and, you know, rolled, survived the fall. And uh, he came in just exactly the same hit and tumbled and got up and he said, man, you're fast and you got here pretty quick. You'll probably survive. <laughs> I can remember that. This is like your first 10 minutes on the ground in Vietnam. Yeah, it was. And, and ironically, uh, the second plane that came in, a mortar round had gone right through its wing and I could see it peripherally from my eye. I, you know, the mortar round came through right through the wing, the planes going and it kind of exploded by the time the uh, rear uh, tail section got to it. I don't think it did any damage to the plane, but uh, you know, finally the sirens went off and, and uh, quit getting wow. incoming and uh, formed back up and, so it was a uh, pretty exciting first 10 minutes in. Well, Denver. yeah. So my, yeah, my next question was going to be, you know, how long was it before you uh, had the concrete realization that you were in a war zone? And it sounds like within five or 10 minutes of, of setting foot in South. Yeah. yeah. Da Nang at that time was getting mortared and rocked it pretty heavy. Uh, uh, yeah, from a place called dog patch, which, you know, a bunch of uh, civilians and pretty poor side of the town, uh, kind of over by SP2. And it was, you know, the airport was within range of that area. And that's where some of the guys said the fire was coming from. The rockets came in from over Hill 37 from what we called the rocket belt that kind of the belt, kind of the rocket beltway around the inland part of Da Nang and in the military complex there. And uh, wow. consequently, that's where I was assigned to 7th Marines and their tactical uh, responsibility was to try to prevent the uh, influx of, of NVA bringing rockets in and setting them up and firing them to the, you know, to the Da Nang vital area. We had intel that there was a, um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, gun up there and and it was also an op for the nva to guide and uh, and uh direct their 
rocket fire uh, on the air place. From the top of the hill, you could see the airstrip and stuff and a lot of the uh, different vital areas within the uh, Da Nang area over there were wow. a pretty busy area. Now, were you were you with Force, Force Recon then? Did you? Oh, never was. Uh, you know, we were just... Uh, you coordinated with him. Well, not really. Uh, we had, like I said, Lieutenant Crockett, uh, some of the other guys had been with uh, either Battalion or Force Recon and uh, assigned to Charlie Company. And that's kind of what started these little killer teams that we started doing, interdicting uh, tax collectors and and um, uh, yeah, kind of along the lines of the Force Recon Stingray patrols where uh, they kind of went from keyhole operations to these uh, patrols where they would actually call in uh, supporting arms and stuff on targets. Before that, they'd go in and snoop and poop and get out without hopefully anybody detecting them without doing any of that. And, sure. and I think General Walt in 66 or seven or something said, no, we got to do this small unit action with the force recon, uh, battalion recon. And it kind of trickled down to the line companies too in their own little tactical area responsibility because uh, you've got a squad of anywhere from 12 to 16 guys or a platoon of 40 some guys in, and they can't really move around in those areas quietly. Yeah. Uh, or without detection. So we started doing these little small four, well, five, six man teams that uh, would drop off from a night ambush and stay behind and wiggle our ways up to uh, observation post and and uh, search around for targets and try to catch somebody, uh, you know, unexpectedly. And then uh, we either have the sniper teams or or Dwayne with his, uh, as the artillery observer or myself as a mortar observer. Um, we had our uh, S2 scouts uh, mm -hmm. and they were qualified for uh, uh, supporting arms as well. And then, uh, uh, you know, we'd call fire missions in on these guys and, and uh, hopefully so, do so some you, damage. So you went out with these small teams then? Yeah. And if something's identified, then you call in the the mortar fire. Well, mortar or artillery. Or artillery, yeah. Yeah. Now, were you part of these killer teams as well? Yeah, I since I was an FO, the FO and the scouts and the uh, snipers uh, were all the key component of these killer teams because we had the skills to, uh, you know... Um, uh, use the supporting arm systems that were set up. Uh, you know, the 7th Marines had a 105 battery with them. Uh, there were also some Army uh, batteries with 155s that were within, uh, we were within their artillery uh, umbrella. Uh, and then, of course, fixed wing. Da Nang was just over the 327 from us, and uh, we could get fixed wing pretty quick. I never did call any any jet uh, uh, missions, but uh, now these are these are called killer teams because of the firepower that you're able to call in, right? Okay, but you you said something earlier about like going after tax collectors and things like that. We got a request for volunteers to go out into the village where we had intel that the tax collector was going to come into this bill at night and of course collect taxes and and uh so we uh formed up a and a real experienced fire team and uh sergeant burke myself and walt zittle was the patrol leader with the fire team and and uh went out and you know, set up an ambush for this tax collector. And uh, when he came in, we basically tried to capture him, uh, ended up killing him. Uh, uh, after he had been, after he came into the village and went down into, uh, most of these villages had little bunkers mm. that they dig, you know, and at nighttime, a lot of their villagers would go down and stay in these bunkers and, uh, uh, anyway, this guy went down, got in the bunker. And when he came out, we tried to nab him and, and 
consequently killed them and and then uh, uh you know uh got into the bunker and and tried to question the uh the village head person there and and of course we didn't have an interpreter with us but uh eventually uh mike sprague uh and his kit carson scout chin took a patrol out there and then questioned him and got some and tried to get some intel from him and uh so those kind of patrols were not frequent but they were you know i was probably involved with six or seven of them in in my time there Sort of the special missions? Yeah, they had, you know, just uh, abnormal missions, that's for sure. Are you willing to share another memory of one of the other unique missions that you went on? Well, we had one that kind of went south on us. Uh, we were way out in uh, Happy Valley, uh, and uh, we were on a, uh, with the squad, it, patrolled out to uh this hill 26 uh and away from hill 26 we set up a night ambush and then in the morning uh, uh the squad got up and and moved out to their next checkpoint uh for the day's patrol and we kind of broke off and headed up to uh, a vantage point where we were we were set up and uh, um started observing the valley and uh pretty slack day i remember uh one of us had a little transistor radio which, which was, sounds real stupid but uh and it probably was um but we were playing i think we were listening to uh geez i think it was uh texas longhorns and somebody else playing uh, one of the guys was from texas and so he was really interested in and listening to this uh, ball game, uh, November 14th, uh, 68. And uh, all of a sudden down in this uh, derelict rice paddy, feral rice paddy, uh, it was kind of a size of about a half a football field and kind of oval with a hillside on the opposite side from us. And, uh, and there was a little trail that that bordered that side of the rice paddy and and went on out to the east. Uh, and there were two NBA that started walking down there. The front guy was not armed. He didn't have a, a rifle and and uh, an AK. And the guy in the back did. And so we alerted on that right away and and set up and. Uh, uh, called it in and and we were ordered to go ahead and take them out and and so we we did we attempted to anyway we killed the first guy right off the get-go but we should have killed the guy with the rifle because he ended up killing two of us uh, we went into the jungle after him and stuff and two of my guys got uh, shot and and uh, uh, Bartlett and I continued in it set one of the guys up, a really good black guy. I can't remember his name. He could, he stayed in the Corps and retired as a sergeant major. Uh, but uh, then we had a uh, squad come out and help us, and uh, we finally found the guy and killed him. But uh, two of the guys in our little team got killed. Uh, we thought they, they were dead. Uh, you know, we couldn't get a pulse we didn't have a corpsman with us uh, nor did the squad that came out and uh i called in a routine helicopter or medevac and and so they they it was pretty busy around couldn't get one in right away and just after dark finally a 34 came in and and uh picked them up and there happened to be a woman nurse uh on board and and i was lifting uh one of the marines up and she had a stethoscope on, stethoscope on him right away. And she says, my God, this one's still alive. Why didn't you call in a priority medevac? And, and either Fiaco or Kennedy died on the chopper ride into NSA. So that was a sad moment for me. What were their names, Fiaco and Kennedy? Yeah.
when the Russians uh, came into Prague, uh, David's father got killed uh, by the one of the Russians there, uh, and he said his dad was. He was told that his dad was uh, throwing Molotov cocktails on the tanks and stuff, and the Russian communists killed him. And uh, Fiaco, I just had a. He was uh, probably because of that. He was just you know real vindictive uh, towards the communists. Uh, didn't matter if they were Viet Vietnamese or or probably Russian. He didn't care. He was he wanted to kill communists and. Uh, So the nurse on the helo has the stethoscope and she indicates that one of these two, Kennedy or Fiaco, was still alive and, and then asks why the emergency medevac wasn't wasn't called in. We thought and, they were both dead. We couldn't de we couldn't detect a pulse, which happens. Sure. You, know, you 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 uh, somebody goes into shock and it's hard to get a pulse on people. Is that one of those things, you know, you often hear from combat vets where vets will say that they just go over, they go over something in their mind over and over and over again through the years. Is is this one of those things for you that, um, you know, that you, what you often hear from vets, well, if I had done this then, or I maybe I should have done that, or... Is is this one of those things for you, or or it's a it's a terrific regret that you know stays with me. And and Marine Corps birthday is of course November eleventh, mm -hmm. and November fourteenth this happened. So I'm always reminded by it, and I always uh, uh, think about those two Marines, uh, particularly those two Marines uh, uh, being close friends and and losing them through. Uh, well, probably mistakes. Uh, you know, I don't know how we could have done a better job in in um, in uh, trying to detect a pulse or a breath. But uh, uh, you know, to us, in at that moment, uh, we thought they were dead. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Small units of NVA, well trained, uh, hardcore VC, uh, VC that were, you know, uh, traveled north and and formally militarily trained. They'd come back usually in kind of a a, a pale blue uniform mm -hmm. rather than a khaki uniform, and uh, you know we'd see them out and uh, I called in missions on two or three occasions on on uh, company size uh, hardcore VC in the Dodge City area. And uh, and when you did that, I mean, were you able to, are you have these VC in sight and then you're able to see the artillery come in on them? Right. Uh, the first event was I was at, I was in the tower on Hill 37 and uh, and Pat Patterson, who was the FO for uh, Alpha Company, was with me. And uh, uh, we uh, somewhere I got a kind of a Marine Corps probably stole it uh, ship binoculars, and they're about this long, great big ocular lenses, and and crystal clear. Uh, I could just about see people walking around on the top of Hill 327 there, just uh, the, the mountain range that uh, was between us and Da Nang and um, really great glass. Uh, so we were watching out there at Dodge City and all of a sudden here, here's this blue, almost looked like a a bunch of ants running out there and we could see the blue in between all the foliage of the mm. kind of the chaparral that grows out there thick chaparral till you get to the tree lines and then it's more jungly uh and uh so sure enough the hardcore bc so uh he and i both called in uh several batteries on on those targets uh, and i don't this question is not meant 
to be morbid or prying, but, you know, um, given the things that you've seen, I'm assuming, you know, I'm assuming that you are in a number of firefights, you're out on patrols, you know, guys, guys are getting hurt, Marines are getting hurt, Marines are getting killed. Um, in these instances, you know, after you've experienced a good bit of that, and you've seen Marines get hurt, you've seen Marines get killed, you've seen Marines get medevaced, um, when you have these kinds of experiences where you see the enemy, and you can actually see the fire coming in on them, was there that sense of, um, well, let me ask you, I mean, the sense of mission accomplished, sense of revenge, sense of what? It, how would you, how would you describe when you're witnessing that? Is that okay? They got us. Now we're now we're getting them back. I uh, I never had any remorse whatsoever. Uh, I felt it was a good job done. Um, I won't say I was proud. I felt an exhilarating an exhilarated moment by being successful. Um, you know, it's what. I wanted to do, you know, that's pretty much instilled into you going through boot camp and ITR and bits, and then you get to uh, your unit and uh, your officers and your staff NCOs are all professional Marines. I mean, they've got years and years of experience with uh, some of them World War II and Korean War experience and, and, uh, and to, be a Marine, uh, uh, the panty way stuff goes away. Uh, you know, I, I can't say that I honestly know, and there may be any Marines who, uh, that I know anyway, who have ever had any remorse. There's, you know, there are situations where, um, I can reflect back on and, and wonder if uh, uh, an action I took was justified or not. And, and um, I had to kill a young kid. And, uh, and I, it wasn't premeditated. It wasn't, I would have never done it except the situation presented itself where uh, it was a split, faster than a split second decision and uh, he was putting his little brothers and sisters in, in, uh, into a, a refuse pit that we had left behind us after being uh, 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 external, externally uh, resupplied by helicopters. And then uh, in a bomb crater, we had stacked up all the debris, the dunnage left from the resupply and the engineer, what this was a battalion movement. The engineer, uh, we were on an operation. I think it was out in the Arizona territory, uh, and uh, it's supposed to be a free fire zone. All the villagers and stuff had supposedly been uh, relocated, but you'll see these little pods of people that still exist out there somehow, and and this uh, probably a. 10, 12 year old kid uh, and his little brothers. I think there was three of them, uh, a sister and two little brothers. Uh, and they were running down into that uh, bomb crater, pulling stuff out, you know, trying to, for whether it was shelter or whatever they had in mind, but, and it was on fire. And uh, I was tailing Charlie <clears throat> of the battalion CP. And uh, so I was the last one to leave. Just ahead of me was an engineer that was going to stop on a 500-pound bomb that uh, we had found to uh, set a charge on it and blow it. And then uh, not only was I tailing Charlie, I was also security for him. And uh, as I look back about, I don't know, 100 meters or something up on this hill, I saw him, this kid pushing his little brothers and sister in there. And and I knew it was going to blow up. And I, I had an M14, uh, put it on him. Just as I pulled the trigger, the dump blew up. And uh, 
you know, just I had a radio. I always carried a radio. Being an FO, I was no longer a, an active FO, but I always had a Prick 25 with me. It was it was my weapon, basically. And uh, and uh, so I carried an M14 with a Starlight scope and a Prick 25, and along with everything else. And uh, so that you know that I I really don't feel bad about it because I think I did the right thing. And then the feedback I got from a person I was talking to said, well, you were, he didn't say I was justified or I was this, but he said, just think that the, the C4 killed him, you know, don't, you had no part of it. And uh, so that's the way I took it. And so far as you know, did the two younger kids, did they? All survive? survived. They were vaporized. All of them were all yeah. taken out. Yeah. You know, we don't want to leave all that stuff behind. So always put charges on it or if try to and, and uh, destroy it, you know, so it it becomes useless to uh, your, your, <laughs> the PC or the NBA. Right. Yeah. So your intent was to effectively rescue those two younger kids. I I felt I needed to to basically terminate their older sibling to save their lives. Uh, he, uh, no, he did not know there was a charge there. Uh, sure. The kids were hesitant to go in there because the fire, you know, they didn't want to go, but he saw something that he thought they needed and, and was uh, pushing them in, you know. Wow. What was it that motivated you to volunteer for FO in the first place? That's a pretty dangerous job. Oh, I think since I was a child, you know, I like cowboys and Indians and, and uh, World War II and World War I, uh, you know, I always uh, watched the TV and, and uh, my father was a, a worked for the post office as a letter deliverer in, in town. And uh, he was a uh, Navy veteran. A couple of the fellows he worked with were Batan death mark survivors. And my woodshop teacher was uh, a uh, Batan death mark survivor. And uh, principal of the high school was uh, a uh, still active uh, reserve uh, colonel. And uh, so the Marines were the thing that I, I really wanted to. I had, you know, you get uh, John Wayne and the Green Beret and all that stuff kind of exciting, but I always wanted to be a Marine. And, and I, I didn't know very much about mortars. Uh, mortars didn't ever seem to me like a viable component of a, of a, of a Marine, an infantryman. Uh, so there, I was ignorant. And uh, and I wanted to be that grunt, you know. I wanted the backpack and the weapon and and the canteen and and uh, you know uh, get out there and and get into battle. Uh, so the uh, opportunity came, and and uh, so I volunteered. There are some benefits to it, you know. You're you're putting yourself out there where the mortarman. Uh, really aren't. Uh, I think there was two operations that I was on with, with during my time where the mortar sections were actually with us in the field. They were mostly on the static static uh, hills where either the company or the battalion CPs were. Uh, so they took care of the guns and the ammo and, and uh, you know, uh, fired the fire missions for us and, and uh, Right along with the uh, you know the 105 battery guys and and uh, so I didn't like the hill. I felt like a target on that hill. And uh, you're static. Uh, you get mortared. You get rocketed. You know, sniped at. And they know where you are. You know, you walk around on the hill. They could ding you from the tree line right outside the wire if they wanted to. And um, I didn't feel safe there. The other part that uh, was a little nerve reckoning is you know the racial conflict at the time uh was pretty serious uh and a lot of um 
in those static areas where there's boredom and time and and um, discouraged uh, ethnic groups, uh, Chicanos and Blacks, and then the some of the uh, you know Caucasian people. Uh, the racism was was pretty thick uh, in the field. You didn't have that. So at least one of the advantages of being out, you know, on patrol or, you know, being a forward observer or something is that you're, you're out of those static areas more. Is that, is that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And when I wasn't uh, patrolling uh, some of the time I was uh, up in the towers, you know, the observation towers on these static bases and, and uh, you know, taking a shift up there and, and, uh, or in the, in the CP bunker, uh, uh, monitoring the radio and and that kind of stuff and um uh so i don't want to paint a, a dim picture that every day was like that but there were times when when there was some serious racial differences that that would cause uh harm to anybody around so when when when, when marines went out on patrol though all of that and now you're relying on one another you know as you're you're looking out for traps you're looking out for ambush all that stuff goes away and now you're a team it seems to and i don't care if you're black white chicano native american uh uh when you're in the field which you know the guys in the in the platoons and the squads uh were i mean they they'd patrol three or four days come in for a night do line perimeter watch, you know, kind of get a little rest, uh, some good meals and uh, get all their gear ready and cleaned and then back out they go. You know, they didn't have very much time to, you know, <laughs> the boredom was just boredom at a night ambush or, or walking on the patrol or whatever. And, and, and wondering if you're going to make it to the next day, but uh, on those Hills, there was a lot of just static time. I actually put in order a request to extend and, uh, you know, being with the line company, I, I never met my uh, company commander. Um, I have no idea who he was for practically the whole 13 months. And, and, uh, so I had gone into the admin building, H and S company, uh, and, uh, requested a form for a six month extension and filled it out and, and never heard anything all this time from that point, which was about four months before my rotation day. Uh, I kept waiting for orders for my extension and it never happened. Um, so we were out on a, on an operation, uh, in the Arizona where, uh, our battalion commander was adamant about chasing down this NBA regiment that had plagued us. And uh, he got killed on that operation. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dodd. And uh, in fact, he got killed the day I left and uh, the day after I left. And uh, anyway, my company commander happened to be on that operation. We got on this hill they called the hot dock, which was just barren uh hard as a rock and and uh, i happened to be standing next to him taking my pack off and i felt my foot just give away just a fraction of an inch and i froze and i looked down and there i could see just the top of the 105 round and and uh, knew there was a, a pressure uh, they call them uh, a shoebox detonator where you put your foot on and it it pulls the detonating cord out of uh, a uh, oh, kind of like a chai com grenade where it causes friction in there a spark and then it it blows that round up and um, I hit him his back was to me and I hit his back really hard and I said freeze don't move and uh, anyway we got that disarmed one of the Kit Carson scouts came over and disarmed it and uh, he was very familiar with it and and uh, then about 15 meters away, there was another one. Uh, so we're lucky that no one got hurt by uh, those two booby traps on that hill. 
and shortly after after the kind of the rush was over and people started tending to their own gear to get ready for the night defensive position and stuff um i had to talk with them and um I said, sir, I had put in for a six-month extension my rotation dates like next week. <laughs> and I haven't heard anything. And he said, Well, I don't believe in extensions. I didn't, I didn't uh, authorize an extension for you. And so I would have thought after the close call, and this is the second close call that you've told me about in terms of mines, and you know, maybe there are others, but this is the second close call. I would have thought after this second close call, um, you would have thought, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to extend um, after all. Um, but the discussion with the officer is what happened. To it my didn't ex- cross my mind. You know, that's just part of the territory. And I, you know, you think, I think, well, geez, I just don't want my mom and dad to have to face that guy in uniform with the telegram or something, you know, at my house at, at home. Uh, but that that's behind you, you know, that's not your job now. You're a Marine and, and, uh, and that's kind of what I felt about it. You're hyped. Uh, your senses have been so developed that uh, you, the Marines you're with, you can be dead asleep and, and say in your hooch and, and, you hear a door open and footsteps coming up to two or three steps up into the thing. You know who it is. You get so keen that you don't even have to look because you know that person's mannerism so keen. Your senses are so sharp that you can hear a breath. And uh, I came off a... I think it was one of the killer teams. Uh, and uh, I was the only one in the hardback hooch. And we kept the 50 caliber and the 60 uh, machine gun in this hooch and right inside the front door. And the hardback was surrounded by sandbags about five feet high. And it was on a hillside. So uh, the, the hooch was up on piers, so to speak. And... Um, we had a we had a Vietnamese garbage truck that this was on Hill 22 had a Vietnamese garbage truck that would come in every Wednesday and they'd pick up all the trash and stuff. And um, uh, I heard that truck. I mean, I was sound asleep in the rack. It come in about six o'clock that morning. And we had a couple of cooks that were just great. As soon as you came through that gate, they had breakfast waiting for you. Great cooks. Heckle and Jekyll, two black guys that were just super guys and uh boy they did everything they could for the grunts and so ate breakfast came back up my gear straightened out uh sleeping in my rack had a rubber lady there and a mosquito net over me and and uh sound asleep and all of a sudden i heard this tinkle tinkle and i knew exactly what it was it was the uh slide mechanism coming out of that 50 caliber and I looked over and there was a, there was a, 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 I assume a VC young kid in just as, just a little tight on shorts who I can only think must have been clung, clung to the bottom of that garbage truck. Of course, it was inspected when it came through the gate by whoever was on gate duty, uh, but they came down and they, he must have dropped out from underneath, came through the little entryway, the sandbags, up through the screen door. I didn't hear the screen door open, but I heard it as soon as he started dinking around with that 50 caliber. And my weapon was over here. And uh, by the time I got my weapon and he, he didn't think anybody was in there. I was, you know, so dead asleep and kind of sunken down in the mosquito net. He couldn't see me, I guess. And my bed was right, you know, within, I don't know, five meters from him, maybe even four. And by the time I could get my weapon uh, swung around on him, uh, he was gone. And of course, I ran out and alerted everybody. And we looked all over the place for him and couldn't find hiding or hair of him. But uh, 
that gun became inoperable after that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, he he uh, he made it. We sent it back to uh, uh, NSA and everything. They have them go through it, and and it came back. We still it still wouldn't fire right. It it fired two rounds and jam, and I don't know what he did to it, but. Uh, one of the Marines I went to boot camp with was out firing H and I H and I's that I had set up uh, harassment and interdiction of the enemy, just random targets out there where you think you might catch an unsuspected VC or NBA patrol. And uh, usually you threw, you fire those three or four times a night. And uh, anyway, this young Marine was out there uh, firing his H and I and the gun blew up. Just the night before we had been attacked and they had actually come in the in the wire. 65 is where our 105s were battery was, and so it was pretty active. And they were always hitting it with mortars or zappers and stuff. And, and we'd always find leaflets in the in the uh, in the uh, in the shitters, you know, uh, America near this or that, you know, bundles of them actually. And and I, and I know these zappers would come through the wire and put those in there, just psych, psychological warfare. And, and uh, I, I never kind of put it together until I was reading uh, some of the Mac V. Sog stuff where we were planting munitions that would blow up on the NBA or VC. And it, it really does a number on your head when that happens. You know, you don't trust your ammo and stuff. And it's pretty hard to go to war that way. But uh, and I always was curious, and, and I'm practically certain that those zappers would come in and booby trap our rounds. Uh, so that explains it just why seems on, uh, yeah, that explains well, the issue. You drop in the tube, out. it'd blow up, and, and uh, of course, it killed him. And uh, first, why it killed the gunner and uh, took the legs off the A gunner in, in the first uh, circumstance. When you look back on all this stuff now, I mean, all these years later, more than 50 years later, you just described a mortar guy who lost his legs when the mortar blew up. I don't know if you saw that or not, um, but I'm sure you saw, if you didn't see that, you saw a lot of things like it and, and you heard about it. And all of these things, and you've, you've just shared a small number of the many, many things you could share. When you look back on it now, all these decades later, what does all of that mean to you now? What is the significance of all of that now? Uh, uh, just what a waste, terrible waste of lives and, and people's futures. Um, extremely angry at the establishment for uh, uh, putting us there, you know, the the sequences of events and, and uh, the, you know, the terrible decisions, uh, the greed, um, and uh, all those young servicemen who are ignorant, you know, infantry as infants going to war, uh, you know, we're basically cannon fodder and, and for reasons that are uh, un, unsubstantiated, really. Uh, I think we were lied to. Uh, and uh, I, re I regret the war and what it did to the Vietnamese people uh, and what it did to... Uh, our countrymen who served uh, both women and, and men. If someone could give you a potion that would take away all of the bad memories you have about Vietnam, um, you could, whatever good memories you have of your 13 months in Vietnam, you could keep those, but all of the bad memories from your 13 months in Vietnam would go away would you do that? No. Why not? Uh, it's who I am. You know, I, I chose to go. Uh, I think if you 
since I did and and I was there with those people I don't ever want to forget them I don't want to forget the bad memories because it's what makes me today uh it's honoring them the way I remember them and and sorry to have seen them many cases die and and lose arms and limbs and you know their health uh, I don't ever want to forget that um and and really it's there were some good times but uh, uh I remember those bad times mostly and I don't I consider it it is bad but I also consider it an honor to to uh remember them and in the circumstances together if that makes sense suppose you didn't have a choice and the order the order came down that you you are tomorrow going to lose all of your memories of Vietnam, except for one. You get to keep one. What memory do you think you would keep? I think the experience I had with Fiaco and Kennedy on that killer team patrol and and losing them and and. Uh, and the other Marines that were with us that day. Uh, I don't ever want to forget that. I've been back to Vietnam twice, and um, that's part of, I think, my regret of the war is seeing how the people have developed after the war. Uh, in 2002, you could still see a lot of the old country and the old ways and not so much progress, you know, after whatever, how many years that is after the war. But in 2010, there was a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, uh, foreign investment in the country that kind of blossomed it in terms of, uh, of its advancement back into the global economy, I think, and stuff. And I'm real proud of the Vietnamese people communist or not, I think that their resilience is just remarkable. I was very surprised that I just, I was able to go any place, you know, just remembering from you know, 30, 35 years, years earlier and, and uh, yeah. traveled around, visited those battle sites that both Dennis and I had mm -hmm. participated in and uh, did some eulogies and honoring some of our fallen brothers there.